Welcome to Power of the Tribe podcast. I'm your host, John Connors. I'm also the founder and head instructor of Connors Martial Arts in Norwood, Massachusetts. We teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is amazing martial art, Muay Thai kickboxing, the martial art of Thailand, and mixed martial arts. And I'm here with Dan Robin. How you doing, Dan? I'm good. It's our Happy New Year episode. Happy New Year. It's January 3rd, 2020. Yeah. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. How's your year going so far? So far, pretty good. I got on the scale today. Uh, I'm about five and a half pounds above my uh, competition training weight. I take it. Not horrible, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I to- I'm avoiding the scale. You're avoiding the I scale. I'm going to wait till probably like Friday. You were up in the mountains. Yeah, but it was a disgusting uh, two weeks. You know, like I didn't, uh, there was a solid week of me not working out and a right. solid two weeks of just total lack of any sort of uh, healthy, you know, just eating cookies. And well, I had the head and, split open, so I didn't train for about yeah. a week. And then, Dimitri, I was de- texting him. I thought he ghosted me. I thought Dan, the man who gets ghosted, was flipping the the, yeah. the script and ghosting me, but he was, I was out of range. Yeah, that's a pretty it's good a, place to go where you're out of. Range, yeah, away right? from humanity. That's yeah. what I love about it up there. Yeah, I love to go up. I've told you this. I go up. This was with my family, but often I go up with just my dog or dogs, and then uh, I just like complete hermit, complete recluse up there with my with dogs. your dogs. That's yeah. pretty cool, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Especially then if your phone's not working, you don't get on the internet, you're just like... You're what is it about everything. dogs, Dan, when I used to have a bloodhound named Yogi, who was an amazing dog, probably a dog you would like. He was like 100 pounds and just like awesome. And before I got him, I was fantasizing about being in the woods with my dog. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, there's something about that that's in the human genome or something, right? Maybe. I think it's a good way of being by yourself and away from everybody, but not totally lonely. Like, you know, right. not totally right. there with no one. To, like, you can talk to the dog. Or you get a trusted there's companion. There's some interaction. Yeah. There's some interaction. The dog Nobody's is on a, your side no matter what. It's like interaction and company with no judgment or worrying what you said mm. at all. Not that you worry, not that I worry almost ever about what I'm saying, but it's still different, you know, to yeah. just be away from everyone. I don't know if you recall... Before the Boston Open, I came across a book by this guy, Tom Bunn, and it was like the 10-day uh, program to be ex- panic-free or anxiety-free. And one of the methods was to imagine your dog looking you in the face and right. <laughs> wagging his tail. And apparently that simulates oxytocin in us, which it, which is like, I think that's a vagal breaking thing or something where you it's hard to have a stress response when your dog is by your side and is happy to see yeah. you. I think it probably works. I can remember yeah. one from 25 years ago when I was moving to a ballpark somewhere on there where I was moving to Indiana and it was sort of a uprooting of everything. I, you know what I mean? Everything got thrown in That's a van. That's stressful. And it was just, I was moving out to Indiana and you know I didn't know anything about Indiana. I didn't even really understand what the, you know, I was going to. I know doctor. basketball and Larry Bird. That's it. Do you Bob, know anything else about Indiana? I don't know. Well, Bobby Knight. Bobby was, Knight. He was there. Right. I was going to Indiana University. Right. But I didn't even understand really like what sort of research I was, but you know, it was really kind of vague about, I wasn't positive where I was going to live. The whole thing was kind of a mess. And, um, but I brought, but my dog was with me in the moving van. Oh, wow. And like, I would just feel like I just sort of pet the dog and he was real steady too. He would just sort of look at me and I'd be nice. like, it's all right, pup. You know, give him a pat. And what was his name? Can, Zach. Zach. That's a good. Now name. it was a, a strong do- name at the time. It was a dog name. Now, since that time, it became like every person, every kid's been named Zach. Oh right. What breed was he? It's called a Bouvier. Oh yeah, I know the you Bouvier. Oh Most yeah. Most people don't. Bouvier de yeah. Flanders. Bouvier de Flanders. Yep. So people hear it. It sounds French, so they think like a French poodle or lap dog, but they're not. They're powerful built dogs yeah. kind of stocky my memory yeah. of the, the ones that i've seen very quiet on a stoic dog completely accurate yeah very cool dog yeah just kind of follows you around quiet cool i read it, an article about the bouvier de flanders in sports illustrated of all places yeah, I know like it. you know the article yeah well because i had a bouvier so uh I, this is like in the 70s dan yeah. the article came out like 1975 or i know something. the article though yeah. and in in the article they said 
the Bouvier de Flanders has the strongest bite per square inch or something than any other canine. So, and the guy in the article, they were sort of guard dogs or something. The guy was training. So my dad came home one, like right around the same time. And he goes, yeah, my, my buddy at work, he's got a German shepherd and they have the strongest bite of any dog. So that's what he, he, and I go, oh yeah. And I whipped out the sports (laughs) illustrated. I think my dad took it in to debunk this other guy. And they're probably both wrong, right? I think they're probably both wrong. It's like some kind of pit bull or something, Yeah, something with a bigger head. Bull right. Mastiff. Like Bull Mastiff, gonna, you know, got to be gonna it, match right? match that when you're a yeah. German Shepherd with that little narrow face. Right. right. I don't yeah. want to get bit by any of them. No. But my Bouvier had big werewolf teeth. I remember I could oh, pull right. his lips back and his teeth were just humongous. They're almost like uh, a gigantic Scottish Terrier yeah. on steroids or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, he was so calm. Yeah. Like you just feel like he'd be like, it's fine. We're going to Indiana. And also I think there's something about your role with the dog is to calm them down, like to be the the alpha, the alpha. So it's sort of yeah. like it puts you in that mindset of like not being nervous and not being because you're right. like in charge, you know. Now, your dog guy, I know that. Do you ever have you must have watched the Dog Whisperer, that show? Yes. So my take on that show, Dan, as I've watched many episodes, is essentially the answer to every dog situation is the dog needs more exercise and the owner needs to act like the alpha. Yeah, that's pretty much his whole thing. That's the whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to me to watch these dog trainers. So, but do you believe that's a valid theory to be a f- fundamental I theory? I think there's more specifics to it than that. But like there's a couple so a couple But if things. you got that wrong, nothing else is going to work. So if you have a dog and it's not getting proper exercise, it doesn't matter what training you're giving it, right? No, it's going to lose its mind. I think it all mind. depends on the dog is the thing, right? Like there's Probably well, the amount of exercise. Dogs well, that's it. Well, the amount fine. of exercise per dog is going to vary. Right. But I'm saying, if the dog isn't getting proper movement, it's like a human being. Like you're not going to be good, right? Right. Yeah. You think that probably applies to a lot of human beings, right? Yeah. But I also think, so for the dog whisperer, a lot of people forget. Like, if you have a problem with the dog, like then you need to be alpha. But sometimes people have dogs that are not a problem. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, so for example, he'd always be like, don't let the dog go out the door before you. Before you. Yep. But like. Which is I, very hard I, to but do, But I'd right? let the dog go out before me. Like, because I didn't have a problem with like, you know right. what I mean? Like, I had a, it was. I, the dog knew you were the dog, alpha. Yeah. yeah. It was fine. So he could go out the door before me. You know, right. so there's a lot of things people follow and it's like, but not everyone needs to do that. Not everyone mm. needs to follow that. But there's a funny backlash because you and I have talked a lot about this before, how the world seems split now into sort of mm. two camps, like a gentle camp and aggressive camp or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. And mm-hmm. and politically it's split in half and it happens with dog training too. So there's this deep hate for the dog whisperer. So there's a faction a of, people. of people out there that hate the dog whisperer. Of dog trainers. Uh-huh. Of dog trainers. Yeah. Dog and, people maybe. Yeah, yeah. and I'm going to go out not much on a limb and say like every single one of these trainers that I've seen say this or at least 95% are women trainers and they're like he's being too rough and mean to the dogs mm-hmm. like he gives them little kicks like I don't know if you like a little he like pokes him in the ribs or something yeah yeah right? like with his foot oh like, yeah do like a heel. little back heel to yeah the, and they're like they're just horrified by any they violence they interpret that as abuse sort yeah and yeah. so he's hated by a lot of Huh. people out there as being too abusive and he's used shock collars okay which again so it sounds terrible yeah like a shock collar like if yeah. i heard it i'm like don't use a shock collar but it's just the word like have you felt a shock collar i might have i've yeah. shocked myself with a shock yeah. collar it doesn't hurt that much okay the, is the facts of it you know it sounds like yeah. you're shocking the dog that's horrible but like it doesn't really hurt that you're much. not torturing yeah. the dog yeah. yeah it just startles so again you could use a shot collar in a horrible way or you could use it in a okay way. It's like everything. It has Right. And I imagine dogs in the wild and wolves when they're communicating with each other, there's probably a little bit of biting going yeah. on. It's not like they're not biting to kill, but they're probably biting to yeah, communicate and correct. Yeah. 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 That's why it's weird why you have to train that out of dogs, because it's normal for them to nip Especially like a kid bothering them, it's normal for them to send the message with a little bite. Like, right, don't right. do that. Yeah. So you can run into trouble with that. Huh. 
But they seem to do, most dogs seem to get out of that. Yeah. Well, they better. Yeah. Especially if you have a big one. I noticed that all these people with little dogs, they have the luxury being like, oh, he bites. Like, I can't have that. I if have you have a friend, hundred pound dog, they I can't bite a, anybody. I had a no friend who, had, about who had adopted this old dog and it was tiny. I don't know what it's, I don't know if it was like a really miniature poodle, but very small dog. And it would just turn around and bite you for no <laughs> provocation whatsoever. And it had like four teeth, but it kind of sucked. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't like being around it. Like it would cuddle up against well, you, yeah. <laughs> and then occasionally it would just bite you like a viper. And uh, and they were and they were completely compassionate about the dog. And they go, yeah, he yeah. does that sometimes. And I'm like, yeah, well, that sucks. Yeah. I don't want to be around this thing. <laughs> One of my good friends in high school had a Doberman, so that's kind of a formidable dog. I think everyone knows what a Doberman is. They are an impressive beast. Yeah, right. And they were, and this one was crazy. So my friend <laughs> lived in a completely crazy house. Yep. And everyone was crazy. And so the dog was crazy. Yeah. Oh, right. So I remember, like, I'd pet the dog, play with the dog, get along with it. One time it literally went to sleep with its head on my lap. Nice. And then it wakes up and just, it just wakes up, like, immediately, like, uh, like this, the worst growl right at me. <laughs> and I'm, like, sitting back against something. I can't defend <laughs> myself at all. Like, and the dog's head, it was on my lap. So it's, like, right here and just, like, right near your bears genitals, its teeth right? and That's... just, like, starts staring it's like this and i'm like i can't move because i'm like sitting against yeah. something and i'm like hey hey man like get your your dog is get your dog and my friend's laughing going oh yeah he does that that's so you just remind me that he, i'm like he does that he it's that. a big doberman and i'm like he's gonna bite me and he's like yeah that's you know, like, like that's, yeah, probably <laughs> that reminds me of like when your wife has a dream where you do something that pisses her off yeah. and she <laughs> wakes up and she's still mad at you yeah. even though she knows it's a dream yeah <laughs> the dog had a dream where you did something bad to it. I don't know what it was. I, you know, I was just kind of backing up and try, trying to back away, trying to like scoot away. But I was like, this isn't, I, I was trying to convey, as you reminded me of the story of your friend's dog, where I was like, it's not like funny if this Doberman bites me. That's not like a little, I, that's I, like stitches in the hospital. And I think people who aren't in the, maybe above 50 or something don't realize, like I grew up in Rosendale yeah. in the 70s. It was the wild west of yeah. dogs. Like there was no leash law, dog yeah. shit everywhere. Nobody picked up dog yeah. shit. It was just there madness. There was no such thing as scooping, right? Like no. when we were kids. No, it was madness. <laughs> and I learned a valuable lesson about sexuality, believe it or not, from dogs. I had this little um, dog, Tara. She was mixed breed. I'm a little uncomfortable going into beautiful, this. Beautiful just dog. So you know. She looked, uh, she was all black. Mm hmm with a little white on the tip of her long tail. It looked like a little fox, fox-shaped okay. dog, beautiful dog. We knew, we were ignorant people. We knew nothing about it, so we didn't get her spayed right away. And she went into heat. And I knew nothing of this. I was a young kid. Yeah. And one day, I looked outside my house, and there were six dogs yeah. sitting on our doorstep trying to get in our front door. And dogs yeah. I had never seen before <laughs> in my life. And, and you uh, as a kid had no idea. What I'm like, what's going on? Mom, why are all these dogs here? <laughs> and it was madness. They yeah. must have come from miles away. Like, I never had seen these dogs before. Yeah. And then one of them, Dan, was a gigantic Doberman Pinscher. Yeah. I mean, gigantic. Black, ears cut, tail bobbed. And we had this little garage underneath our house. And there was a little peak of the garage roof that you could see when we had a sort of like a bay window, like a, a large window that looked out in the street, this dog jumped up onto the roof, that little roof of the garage, and was looking in the window. <laughs> and I thought this thing is going to come crashing through the freaking window. And he, it wanted to, man. Another it was like thing breathing. Another thing the 70s like, was Dobermans were a thing. They did. There was, they that, were big, there yeah. was the Omen. Oh. Were those Rottweilers? Well, did, those are Rottweilers, Dan. Yeah. yeah, I was going to have to trump you there. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but Dobermans... But they were uh, like the scary dogs of the 70s. They were. I think, um, who was the guy that was in Hawaii, the detective guy? What's his Magnum name? Magnum P.I.? They had Dobermans. Remember yeah. the English guy right. running the thing? He had two Dobermans that were the most perfectly trained assassins possible. Yeah, I think some James Bond Dobermans yeah, popped yeah. up. And They're pretty impressive but dogs. But that is right? a funny thought that a lot of the people that may be listening are too young to remember was when dogs were just wild. Like the, like Completely people would just wild. open their doors yeah. and there'd be neighborhood dogs. Right. Someone would bite you and it would just be sort of like, yeah. Like no one would be Got like- bit hey. all the time. Yeah. No one would be like, 
No lawsuits. Hey, don't let your dog out because it bites. It would just yeah. be like, you have to watch out for that dog. He bites. He bites. Yeah. No one would go to the parents and be like, hey, your dog bites. You know, it would just be like. <laughs> no. I had a friend that had a German shepherd and it wouldn't, it didn't, I can't say it bit me, but like it would nip at me. Right. You know what I mean? And like, but that hurt. Like yeah. There'd be like a little blood, like real, a mauling is a different thing. Right. But like, and even back then, I think a mauling people would respond to. But little bites. I remember no, sitting, I my friend Dennis Keating went in his house and, and, he, and he lived like in a three decker in the first floor. And I was sitting out on the back porch on the stairs waiting for him to come out. Probably was like 15 or 16, I don't know. And uh, his sister let their insane German Shepherd out, and he mauled me. Yeah. He just started <laughs> ripping and attacking me and everything. And I was like in a sleepy mood sitting there. And then they just pulled him off of me, and, they, and, they, and she yelled at him and smack swatted him or something. And then that was that. And like my <laughs> arms were all bitten up, and the, my neck was bitten, and that was that. <laughs> We did, and he came out and we just left and went and did our day. It's funny we about doing. that because I have a story like I might have even told you this before, but that I apparently got I didn't get bit up too badly, but I got chased down by a German shepherd. But it bit at me, but it got the back of my coat. But I was a little kid. Oh, right. So it like threw me on the ground. It was dragging like Thr- shaking me back and you. forth, thrashing me. And then they pulled it off. But the funny thing is about these stories. I run into from time to time to this day. I'm sure you have too. run into people that are like. I have some kind of phobia of dogs because I got bit like okay. when I was a kid. And I'm like, well, I apparently got mauled <laughs> at some point, but I don't really remember the story. Like, <laughs> like forget like being psychologically damaged. I don't even remember. I don't even remember. Like my parents yeah. are like, remember that German Shepherd mauled you? And I'm like, more I remember you telling me about it. I don't really remember it. And That's you, very you're funny. Saying you've been bit a lot of times, and yeah. there's no like phobia, or you know. No, I love dogs, but I respect dogs. So if I don't know the dog, I'm not running over there yeah. and putting my face in its face. Yeah. You know, I kind of do the the ghost whisper, the dog whisperer thing, where uh, I just stand there and let them come over if they want to come over. But you know what I mean? Yeah, you're yeah. supposed to. Yeah. yeah. So I used to have a very, very, very aggressive dog called a tibetan mastiff right so everyone says they know about it but they're thinking of an english mastiff no i know the tibetan, tibetan mastiff is a different thing i don't think unless maybe the breedings change they should not be house pets right they should be out in the i've field. never seen one in yeah, real life pretty... i remember looking in the books and see and in the so books they, have... they would say they're so 300 come... pounds yeah they're not they weren't that big oh, okay but it was um yeah i know i saw books where they were like 220 plus yeah you know and i'd be like no they're not that big but the um I was in Indiana, which we just talked about, and uh, some breeder in from Kentucky had Tibetan Mastiffs, and I was like, oh, well, let's get a puppy. I'll be sure to train Cute it. puppy, I yeah, bet, huh? Yeah, I was like... I, what was the coloring like? Uh, like black and tan, long black fur. Black and though. tan. So they're almost like uh, a St. Bernard, kind of? Uh, yeah, but picture the col- the coloring more like a Doberman Yeah, if the tan was But the hair is more like and that. really long hair. Really long hair. Really long hair. Okay. Because they were very formidable. I mean, the real, fu- other than the pit bulls, anything that's a flock guard has to have the long hair. Why is that? Like, so they don't get bit up by the, the wolves. When they're killing coyotes and wolves. Huh. That so gives they, them protections, like armor. Like even that, you know, that Rasta dog, the Commodore, it has like the long. Oh, yeah. Like that's, nothing can bite through that. Imagine trying to bite through that fur. That's very what it's cool. for. So, he, I, and I got him as a puppy. So another thing a lot of people like to do is they get dogs not as puppies, as rescues. And then they like to sort of be like, any bad trait, they say, oh, can you just imagine what he was been through before? So they, this is really interesting to me, Dan. So they attribute bad traits to the nurturing of the environment, not to the nature of the animal. Right. Interesting. And But yeah. it's a but it's a excuse for anything, right? Because they're like, just think of what happened before... I got it in a sort of a blank area. They don't know what happened. It's. I was listening to a podcast, Dan, and this scientist was evolutionary biologist, I believe. And what they're saying is that there's certain human characteristics like intelligence and some other personality characteristics that are 50% genetic, can be traced to your genes, right? Mm-hmm. 10% is attributed to vi- environment. And they know this by... Um, Twin studies, so identical twin studies. So you you have genetically the same people, right? Forty percent. Right? So ten is environment, fifty is genetics. So what's the other forty percent? 
I'll tell you what he says it is. Am I supposed to guess? I can't even think. You can't even it. guess. What else is I there? didn't know know what it is? Developmental. You know what that means? Is our brain starts as like one cell and two cells and three cells and it builds itself up sort of like uh, almost like foam building or something. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that if something happens in the environment where one cell is like one degree off in the beginning, you, you create significant differences so you, you're ultimately. About in the womb. They're saying, de- yeah. yeah, as the organism develops itself, and your brain's still developing as a kid, I guess, too, but the actual physical right. growth and development varies from one twin so even, to another. Right, even identical twins in the womb, one's on the left and one's on the right, and so they're hearing different sounds, and they're sort There's, of knocking into yeah, different Yeah, there may be some they're... hormonal things. Yeah. Or if you have whatever genetic plan you have, you could have come up with something slightly different. So if we cl- cloned you, Dan, the clones would all be slightly different from each other. And that's because of developmental processes. Like you don't have a blueprint where you're putting every cell in place. It kind of starts from, and bubbles up from the nice. beginning. So that that causes, so they're saying that developmental process attributes to 40% of differences in certain characteristics. So that 90% of your intelligence is basically not nurture only 10 percent is like (laughs) listening to mozart when you're a kid and and whatever which is so i i would assume that it's similar with animals too i would think right yeah like dogs for instance maybe maybe i don't know but if you traumatize an animal obviously then you could have a bigger effect traumatize a person or the thing that this tibetan mastiff i had i know because i got him as a puppy I know he he had no like anger or no trauma. in his life or yeah. trauma. And he was the most aggressive dog. Yeah, of course. Like he right? was so like that like so what so people I also raised kids with them. So I'd always get this. People would always ask me like, How how can you have a dog like that with your babies in the house? And I'd be like, My he would never even growl at my kids. Right. He he didn't have that in him. Like so they could like, jump on his head and he wouldn't do anything. Not so they are did, they he, shepherding dogs or guard dogs guard, by uh, by history? They're flock guards. Flock guards. Yeah. Yeah. So they so probably th- think your kids are part of the flock. But they weren't even she- like they're not they weren't supposed to even like answer to commands like to like shepherd. Oh. It was like just go out and kill anything. Kill some other canine. If anything comes into this yard, kill it. Yeah. Like was that how they're designed, right? right? Yeah. Um I, I might have been, I'm suddenly having a flashback to mentioning this like a year and a half ago on this podcast because the other thing about the Tibetan Mastiff is they team them up. See if this sounds familiar with dogs called Lhasa Apsos. You didn't say, I don't, th- I don't remember this, which and is they, also they, a Tibetan dog. Yeah, they'd be a in very t- tiny dog, right? Yeah, they'd be in Tibetan monasteries and the Lhasa Apso was bred to have like great hearing huh. and like hair trigger. So the Lhasa Apso would hear something, start yipping, Set and then the this alarm. beast would just, be like what's this and like go kill go kill whatever it yeah, is yeah whatever it was you didn't say that yeah, that's yeah. a pretty <laughs> that cool, cool concept yeah except when you own one right it's a problem because so what, it, my other dog like my bouvier would bark at someone at the door and i'd be like it's fine he'd be like okay the tibetan mastiff would bark and i'd be like it's okay and he'd be like i didn't if you could stay out of this that'd be great <laughs> like he'd just be like i didn't ask you it would be like stay in your lane dan yeah exactly <laughs> and the other thing is a lot of dogs, I'm sure we all know lots of dogs that bark sort of angrily to like threaten someone away. My Tibetan Mastiff wanted to get the person on the other side of the door. The door. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't alerting anybody. Right. He wasn't he was chasing furious. anything away. He yeah, was like he was looking furious. To kill. Like yeah. he'd be biting the doorknob and biting the windowsill and like just like clearly he wanted to get out. That's scary, huh? So it was sort of like, yeah, it was a problem. And then I'd be like trying to, at first I tried to alpha him. I was a young guy. I'd be screaming at him. And he was just like, I could not get through the dog. Like I couldn't stop him. Before I I got the um, bloodhound, the other dog that I looked at, I thought, this is a really cool looking dog because it looked like a, you know, kind of like a a everyday dog, a man's dog. And then I didn't get it because it was a little bit, like the Mastiff was an Anatolian Shepherd. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. Same, same thing. thing. Like we're just gonna kill whatever comes in the yard. And I talked to the lady who, who had the dogs, and she goes, "Yeah, you need about a fifteen foot chain link fence around your yard." And I was like, "What?" Yeah. 
and uh the other thing about those dogs is they run like they don't yeah they're not meant to like stay in a yard or, right yeah they're, they they don't, be they're not of... really meant to obey you either like i yeah. said they don't like like the herding dogs like they're really good at listening to commands because mm. they but these ones aren't met bred to have any <laughs> commands you know they're just yeah i wouldn't mess with the anatolian shepherd either i'm sure there's sweet ones like they're sweet tibetan mastiffs but also right. mine was bred from tibet like now most of them come through London or something, but like this was just some, I don't know how this, some hillbilly <laughs> in Kentucky had, had some Tibetan Mastiffs. Anyway, a dog episode. We have a dog episode. I love dogs too. Yeah. I don't have one right now, but I do love dogs. Yeah. yeah. So should we, I don't know, should, it's tw- January 3rd. Should we talk about New Year's resolutions? We should talk about New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Because I was right before the show, we were saying how we've changed our minds since a year ago. Last year, we were talking about resolutions, and I had a resolution. What I was your a, resolution? I had a dry January. Okay. No alcohol whatsoever last January. Yeah. Now my mindset through a year of podcasting and talking about these issues, well, it depends. Like, I, again, it's too simple to say a resolution is good or bad. It's what is the nature of the resolution? How do you use a resolution? Like, it is the typical way people talk about it, I think, is worthless, right? It's sort of, they even know they're not going to, listen. you know, you hear people laughing and saying, oh, I'll go to the gym for the first two weeks and then it'll mm. be gone. And that is worthless. Mm. Like a resolution that you know is not even going to produce results ahead of time. I think it's probably worse than worthless, Dan, because you're telling yourself that you're, you're full of shit. Like you're yeah. telling yourself, I don't follow through with what I say yeah. I'm going to do, which is probably not good. It right? sends yourself even a more negative message. Yeah. 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 But I think, so here's what I like about New Year's. And this, the first part hasn't changed. One is looking back on the year before. Mm. And it is the only time I think it is not a bad time to show, feel, not show, to feel some appreciation for things. In All your right. Life. I you like know? what you're saying. Because when else are you going to do it? You know? To look like it's a good stopping point to look back at the year and think about some good things, good friends, good family, achievements like you've had. What did you good so what, job th- or even just your health, like whatever? You know, I, I was talking to Maria Kiprios, yes. one of our coaches and competitors, Purple Belt, and I did this exact thing with her, Dan. Funny you should say that. We were in the sort of lobby of the academy, and, I, and this year went by so fast, Dan. I can't remember any of it. And I asked her, I said, Maria, Go, go, go through with me. I go, you won the Pan Ams, uh, the Absolute, and then you just got a silver in the world. So that's amazing. I said, what else did you do? And she went through all her tournament experience for the year, and it was way more than I, I could have recalled. Mm-hmm. And it was essentially a story of struggle in the beginning of the year and then real achievement toward the right. middle to the end of the year. And when she laid it all out, it was really impressive. Like she did some super fights. She did uh, invitational tournaments. She really did amazing. In the last tournament, she did invitational thing. She did an Iron Woman tournament. These guys down in Connecticut, um, they did a really good job. The name escapes the academy now, but they're nice, really good guys, and they ran a cool little tournament at their academy. And um, Maria ended up coming in second, but she had a great performance, and she won two matches prior to that. Looked fantastic. So just to go through the year like that, you saw, I said, wow, that is really awesome. And, uh, I, and I told her, I said, you should give yourself a serious pat on the back, man. That right. is and really is New Year's awesome. a good time to look yeah. back and just think about that. And have, what, did you do it for yourself? I Maybe did. You well, I've been doing it a lot just because I've been talking about everything. And I, I almost look at it for the last 18 months because that's yep. when we started it. And, and 18 months is almost better than a year, I think, because it gives you a little bit more time to accomplish something. You know what I mean? So I feel like coming up with another sort of 18-month goal. You know what I mean? I don't know why 18 months is appealing to me right now because a year is good, but it's still not a really long period of time. Two years is almost too much to get your head around. 18 months, yeah, I could probably get a lot done in 18 months. So, um, yeah. yeah. And are you thinking of a new goal yet? Are you... I'm think yeah, I'm trying to get my yeah, I'm trying to figure it out because I feel like I need to do something besides competition because I feel like I've I've squeezed so much juice out of that right. And you have the world that orange championship. Yeah. 
And it's also um, and it was so this a lot is, of hard work. Then. So yeah. this is so New Year's one is looking back and appreciating. Two is setting these goals, which are like resolutions, but not the sort of you know what we're talking about now is how how do you set a, a resolution that's helpful mm. as opposed to some garbage that's like I'll do this for three right. weeks and then I'll quit. One would be an eighteen month goal or like a major goal in your life. Like like that, you know. That's very different than saying I'm going to start going to the gym. Well, you know? you know, I was listening to a couple different people. There's this guy James Clear who wrote a really good book called Atomic Habits. If people don't have that, it's worthwhile to get that book, or to follow him on social media too. He's really good. He actually sends out an email, Dan, every I think Thursday, and it's a very short email, but it's really good. And he has like three ideas two quotes and one i don't know it's three two one or something i forget but it's very good uh and i think i was talking to, i think i was listening to scott adams that dilbert guy and his whole thing is systems are better than goals right. think about systems and it's the same thing as habits it's like how am i gonna change my day-to-day -day life in order to but you see i think you need a goal where you're pointing these systems and these habits towards, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any right. sense, right? And this was the last, this is also what I was thinking about, a, about a realistic or a, a, a valuable New Year's resolution is this. And it's something we've talked about, different versions of this on this podcast, right? Which is not, I'm going to go to the gym loosely, or I need to lose weight, or I want to mm -hmm. get stronger, or I want to get better at jujitsu. It's what system do I put in place? Mm. You know, what do I put in place? So you want to get better at jujitsu, what do you do? Right. What are you going to do? Yeah. And like you want to lose weight. What are you going to do? And then do it maybe, you know, forever. Like, do you know what I mean? That's right. the other thing. Like, think of what, what am I willing to do? If not forever, uh, the, this year. Horizon. The year. Like, yeah. long, like so for 2020, you want to get better at jujitsu. What are you going to do? Mm. And it's, uh, you can't just be like, I'm going to go more to the gym. Like, it has to be, I think, specific. I think so. And then that's all the stuff we, I know uh, uh, Rory doesn't want us to talk about the calendar anymore. So, won't, but, but say you're like, I'm going to go to the jujitsu gym more. It's not quite enough. Like, I think you need to put up something like a calendar and be like, I'm going to need to put track an ex, it. extra every time I go. So Dan, track it. I, I purchased two new calendars. Yes. I got one on my office door and one on my bedroom door at home. And as I was putting up the new one, I was taking down 2019 and my son was sitting there and we sort of reminisced, like you were yeah. saying, we went through the year. Oh, here's where we went to, to Rome. <laughs> and, and and here's where we went to the world championships and here's where we did yeah. this and that and he was very kind to me i was like yeah i had a pretty good 2019 and he said dad you made 2019 your bitch yeah. <laughs> it's not politically correct but it was nice of him yeah. to say that yeah i know but it was, actually it was real. you won a world championship it's sort of 2020 has got it's going to be hard to match it it's going to be hard to match it um you think of something you could be a movie here's player. my 18 month goal dan yeah I want to get a publishing contract for a book. So I don't want to self-publish a book. I want to somehow get some foolish publisher to pay me to write a book. And do you get that before you write the book? I think that's how it works, Dan. Yeah, you come up with a book idea. proposal. You like write a chapter. And then I think that's what it is. And I think the reason why that's better than coming to them with a book is they want to give you guidance and input and, and direct how it's going to go so it'll sell better. So what I've so for what I know, that's the approach that could work. So I figure if, if I spend 18 months trying to make something like that happen, it's still a long shot, but it's not completely inconceivable. Right. right. And worst yeah. case scenario, you still have a book written yeah. or something written. It's yeah. not sort of yeah. no downside. And it's like this podcast. It's making our lives better. It's going to be about these ideas probably yeah. and things like this. So. Only something good could come from it, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, which is another good way to ha form your goals. Create goals and processes where, even if you don't hit the goal, your life is better because of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't have New Year's resolutions this year because yeah. I'm just sort of like, kind of happy with what I was doing. You know what I mean? I'm like, let me just Damn, get that's so back under control. Right? Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. Because I think that's the other thing. So, so here's the flip side. Another way of looking at it: you look back on the year. Because someone listening might think this too. They're like, "I didn't win world champ. My year sucked." You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, so then, what do you do? Like, you go, you look. Go, I think again, just analyze it. Like, what sucked about it? What can you change? Dan, I have a theory. It. When do people make major change 
in their life, major changes in their day-to-day processes? Well, my first thought is usually never. Is the okay, answer. okay. And if they do, is I assume more what you're asking. Yeah, when is it? Uh, like it is rare. Usually there's some sort of crisis or wake-up right. call, right? Yeah. Right, like they get dumped or yeah. they get divorced or something and they're like, oh my God, I gotta change the way I'm operating or they get fired. Yeah. Or like something like that happens where the, the environment is telling them, hey, you're not as good as you think you are. And now they're like, shoot, I have to regroup and get my get my shit together here. Right. So I think it is hard when life is good. You know what I mean? When everything is kind of working, you don't have that alarm going off to, to motivate you. So I was thinking that, you know, we're talking about processes, but if you have a goal that's exciting and compelling... It's, it's almost like, for me, I think I need to balance, have an exciting goal with a realistic process. You know what I mean? An exciting but somewhat realistic goal with a doable process. And if, and if I can find that balance, uh, that's where it's going to work for me. Right. And the, other, the caution is, too, is uh, all the details of things you said. It has to be a somewhat realistic goal. Like, it's, it can't be wild. So. And you should probably give some thought to like, will it make you happy? Cause I think sometimes people mm. go wrong on that. You know, they're sort Explain of like, I need to go to the gym and like, it's sort of something else is bought. Like, like their, their relationships keep failing and they're like, I need to get in better shape or something. Mm. It's like, that's not why your relationships are failing mm. or, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah. they just sort of aiming at the wrong goal. Like it's sort right. of, I need to spend more time doing, this or that and it's like that's not really the problem with well, that, well that's another point dan there's always trade-offs yeah. so if you're going to the gym you're not doing something else right. so you're right that it may not be the right choice not everybody should be working out for hours every day who knows right yeah um and i think people underestimate that that if i'm going to choose to do something i'm choosing not to do something else i think a lot of us have a lot of empty space in our life anyways yeah. we're watching usually the TV gym yeah the gym can replace tv or yeah. you know lazing around so usually you can do it but again sometimes a lot of times i think people might lose some weight or get fit and be like i'm not it didn't work like i'm not so happy or you know mm, definitely because of something else like it's like it's not fixing whatever's wrong so it's for some introspection so again that's another thing i think new year is good for like a, a time to some introspection about what if your year wasn't happy why and can you fix it and what can you do but i also think there's some people i don't know if you see this on facebook there's just some people that you can look back year after year they're just the type of person that's always like well thank god that year is over that was a <laughs> worst year ever and then like you say it every year <laughs> you know like it's just it's like and I then, don't think you realize it's your attitude. Like, you, you know, you think every year is just oh, a right. disaster. Yeah. You know, either mm-hmm. personally or like, and then if nothing goes wrong for them personally, they're like, oh, with this president or, you know, something like that. They just mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. think that it's the worst possible year. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, well, you've done this for 10 years. They've been very different years. I think so. I th- Yeah, I think you're touching on something. I think there is a phenomenon that I've noticed recently that, when things are pretty good, people will almost invent problems, right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, life, the other thing is if you go a whole year, probably something not good happens. You know, it's hard to go a whole year. Yeah, definitely. And no one you know passes away and no mm. one you know gets sick. And, no, you know, like that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, so then do you dwell on that or? Definitely. You know. Interesting. Um, but. What I do like, Dan, is I do feel like I'm a little out of sorts because, you know, I had this long-term goal of become a world champion, and I had a process that I was following, and then there's a comfort in that. When you get in the process, even if you're not achieving your goal, it feels good to be following the process. And And can I just say another cool thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to be a a scar on your forehead, (laughs) but that's sort of an added bonus. Right. To be like, not only did you win a world championship, you have kind of this scar, like as like a permanent reminder. Of it. Oh, like, right. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. at, not only reminder for yourself, but like also people can see you and you can be like, I got this winning a world championship. Like, you know what I mean? Right. If they ask, how'd you get that scar? It's like in the 
late 1800s. The, like you didn't even get it. Like the, the, yeah. the guys would have the scar on their cheekbone from yeah. dueling with uh, epées, right? That was right. A, a big But it's just perfect. You, didn't, you got it while winning the world championship, yeah, right? Like it's, even if you got it one tournament earlier, mm. you couldn't say or I in got training. this. Yeah, yeah. In training, right? Yeah, right. you couldn't say that's when you won it. So it's perfect. So, so right? really, yeah, you're right. So you didn't see the upside of that scar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah somebody said that. They, they said, you might end up with the scar there. And I'm like, at this point, yeah, it's yeah. a drop in the ocean. Come on, will you? <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. It's kind of a harmless, good spot for a scar, right? Like right. It's not like, right? I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. And and I'm, I try to be a man's man anyways, right? right? So. But back to your point that now you don't have that goal. Like you got it, mm. so you can need a new one. Yeah. So a book might be a cool one. I think that might be cool. It's tough writing a book, though, getting a book published. I'm, sh I'm sure it's going to be really hard in, in a different way. But if I can find a process and then just do it, I'll, I'll probably find some satisfaction in that. Yeah. You know, We can talk more about it later. I think yeah. you've got some good good selling points, too. Not too, and, many and I, mm -hmm. not too many people have the world championship. You've got a few things that. going to yeah. help, you, help you catch someone's attention. Right. And you may be a movie star in the same. We got a lot going year, on because we got a lot going I, on. I if people don't know that are listening, there's someone's doing a documentary about John's. Generally, about your quest to uh, become a world in the champion, academy, yeah, but or to we've run been, the academy or whatever it is. Filming it, I think, for like three years now. That's so yeah. funny. It's <laughs> it's going to be one of those multi-decade movies eventually. I know, it's going to be good. like when they I'm on like, my deathbed, yeah. they will wrap it all up. Yeah, they were like, you better either win that world. You need an ending, right? So it was like either you better win it or like maybe get, get a fatal. eaten by a grizzly yeah, bear something, or something. Yeah, just, yeah, something horrible happens to you would be another good ending. I noticed that a lot of documentaries something really bad happens or yeah. the subject of it becomes really the subject of ridicule. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's not, you can't, you can't rule that out either. <laughs> can't we, we can't rule that out either. Yeah. They may just turn it all on me. I watched a good documentary on the plane about John DeLore and the, the car makeup. I think I already talked yeah. about that, but yeah, it's a crazy yeah, bastard. That's, you're yeah. right. That's another thing. Everyone making fun of the, the subject. So. Yeah. That's pretty typical. But it's good that you won because otherwise you might. Another thing you could do is just become like a complete like homeless and you know what I mean. It just it ends with you in an alleyway or something right. like that with a bottle of booze and right. And then that would be a good ending too. Yeah, they could let a few years go by and film that, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm still tortured by losing. Yeah, yeah. that could have happened. But um, yeah, so we get a lot going on. Um, I think I'm. I don't know if I mentioned it. I went to train with crew Mark Delagradi at Sit Your Tongue after I came back from the World Championships. And he said, did I tell you this already? I can't remember. I've He's heard like, Delagradi this is the here. best you've ever looked. He goes, you're literally better than you've ever been in your life. And he said, you got that world champion swagger. <laughs> and I told my son this, and he just scoffed at me and said, Dad, you say that basically every other week, that <laughs> you just had the best session you ever had. But he is... Mark is an amazing instructor, and he can yeah, bring out the best many, in you. Many times, yeah. yeah. And um, but there's something about that, Dan. I did feel better than ever, and I think that people, or at least I do, I think probably most of us do. We have a little bit of breaks on us, like something holding us back from the last two percent of what we might be able to express. So then, when you have those moments where you're feeling really good about yourself, and you just let those breaks go. You, you do fully express how good you can be. Right, but it might be a lot more than 2%, too, I think. Some might be. It might 30%, be. 30%, you know, for I'm, some people. I maybe. Think it varies from person to person, right? And I yeah. think a lot of the more successful people you see are people that sort of naturally have a swagger. I think you're right. naturally just feel really good about themselves. Like a and Conor McGregor or somebody yeah, like that, perfect right? perfect example, yeah. A lot of the guys in the UFC yeah. seem to have sort that sort of natural feeling that they're, you know, champions before they're even champions it seems like it's a necessary component right yeah but it's harder as you get older too life beats you down right like i think mm. a lot of people are swaggering around at 20 to 22 you know like mm. and then and just feel like i'm king of the world at whatever you're doing mm. and then you know the guy gordon ryan on. who's the top grappler on the planet he's definitely got that same swagger yeah. he calls himself the king yeah uh he walks kind of with his chest puffed out a little bit which he should because he's amazing uh, and all the major sports of nfl and nba and like they're all told from when they're kids that they're kings of the world too so they 
they've got the swagger built in often because they've been, you know, they're. You must feel that you are right. Um, My son showed me a stat about the Patriots. So they're the team of the decade, obviously Mm -hmm. the NFL, and their winning percentage. I don't want to miss. I don't want to overstate it, but it was well over seven hundred percent. It might have been seven hundred and eighty percent winning percentage or something. Then I mean, (laughs) it's crazy, right? Over over the decade, and the next l- team was uh, maybe the Seahawks, and they were under seven hundred percent. So it's yeah. like they're so far and above better than everybody over an extended period of time. It's just really impressive and remarkable. Well, the length of this run has been insane. Yeah, and I attributed to this concept that we're talking about here all the time about process and system where. They're not just trying to win it this year, like, oh, we're going to trade all our guys and get a draft pick. They're building a process to be successful year after year after year after year in the long term. And uh, I guess everyone else is trying to do it. I don't know, but they're doing it better. I would, I, I'm thinking about as far as practical advice of build this process for yourself. One thing is it takes effort, right? It can be, you know what I mean? Like you have to sit effort. down and think. Like yeah. it's easy to say, I'm going to go to the gym more. You can say that in one second. You know what I mean? Or like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. And, and you no, know you have to do, Dan? You have to examine your failings and your losses. You're going to say, shit, I didn't go to the gym at all this week. Why right. didn't I? Yeah. And, you, and I think a lot of people don't like to look at their short-term losses and they just want to sweep them under the rug, right? right. So they, they lose the value of learning from those things. That's where most of the learning is happening, right? Where something doesn't go quite right and then yeah. you examine it, you know, you, you got to be um, sort of uh, introspective. And do you want people need even before that, and this is going to sound strange, but mm-hmm. they need to really actually want to change something or get better at something. Damn, and that is so good. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like everyone you ask will go, well, yeah, I want to change that. But, like, they don't. You know, they, they don't. You're absolutely right. I think, you know, an evolutionary psychologist says people – make a cost-benefit analysis, and then behave. And it may not be on paper, it may not even be conscious, but unconsciously, that's what's happening. That's how their behavior results. They're like, well, I kind of want to lose some weight, but I really like eating all this pizza and and cake. Uh, I kind of like that better than the cost of of being overweight. So then that results in their behavior, you know? I had a friend, I learned this way back in college, I had a friend that smoked a lot. Mm -hmm. all day chain smoker or, or close to it yep and um he'd be like i really want to quit i really want to quit but then you know and i'd say well why are you lighting a cigarette and he'd be sort of like ah screw it you know i'd be like well you mm. don't you know i'd see it i knew him well to be like you don't really so what want is going to. over there yeah like, so he really sort of wants want to, to quit you sort of want to quit you know it's bad for you but you don't want you don't really want to quit he wants to smoke a little bit more than he doesn't want to smoke yeah. So, so part knows, of them says, I don't want to do yeah. this anymore. But a greater part goes, we want to do this. Right. And eventually yeah. he got older and really wanted to. And then he stopped. You know what I mean? Like yes. when, he, when he really wanted to stop, he stopped. He stopped. So, so how does a person get to that tipping point, Dan? It's basically information, right? Like th- they somehow perceive the benefit greater than the cost, right? Or of switching, yeah. I mean. It could, because there's a cost to stopping bad habits and bad behavior the, you know the cost is you you don't get to eat that stuff you yeah. don't get to smoke yeah so there's definitely a cost so at some point in their mind the scales tip and it's worth doing yeah worth going through the pain of withdrawal yeah. i see i think another example common example is bad relationships right it's people that are like because don't you we all know someone right that it's like you're always dating bad people interesting and, and they'll sort of often in my experience they'll sort of say I know, I know, I know. But then they'd still do it. You know what I mean? And they don't even say, I should stop. Usually they're like, I know, I know. I always date the worst guys or the worst women. But, you know, they almost say they're not going to stop. You know what I mean? It's mm. like, well, then you're going to keep going. And then mm. you have to reach that tipping point that you're talking about where they're mm. like, I really need to date someone else. Like, I really, often it's a crisis of some sort, right? With health or for the cigarettes or a crisis. In a relationship in a crisis and you're like yeah. i need to change who i'm dating or i yeah. need to really examine this i was talking to a guy who was uh an alcoholic drug addict and, and did it for years and years and then he switched and he became completely sober 
and I thought, how did you do that? That must have been really difficult. And what he essentially said was, I woke up and I, f I realized that I was completely alone and I had sort of burned through all of my relationships and it just scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And he changed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it's two, in a way two steps, right? It's really wanting to. Yeah. And then you still have to f figure out how to do it through some yeah. sort of process. Process. Because you can say, wait, your... I really want to stop this now but not know how to do it, like have some trouble getting it done. Yeah. Then you got to structure know. your environment to help you. Your environment, physical environment, environment of people you're hanging out with and everything else to make it work. Like, so for my goal last year of the jujitsu, it's so easy. I own a, yeah. a jujitsu academy. My son is great at jujitsu, so we would just go train twice a day most days. And he's getting better. I get better because he's getting better. Right. But even you know? that, you made up your calendar, right? And yeah. You sort of pressured yourself into training more. Yeah. And made it, it very hard. glaringly obvious when you when you skipped the day of training. Yeah. And yeah. But the environment was optimal, for sure. And there's yeah. days. So, again, so we're always on here saying, like, you won a world championship. I'm like, well, I lost 20 pounds and you lost 20. But, like, to be clear, it's not always, like, that's what I was saying. The last two weeks, I'm like, Lord only knows how much weight I put back on. And yeah. so the last two days, I got back in the working out again, back to the gym. And it sucked, right? <laughs> like, it hurt. I was, like, on the treadmill, like, ah, this is Now, miserable. Dan, did like, you I find really... this? Here's my experience. So I went out probably drank a little bit more than I should have, ate bad, like yeah. less than healthy food. What I found is there was less joy in doing that than I remember there used yeah. to be. And I felt uncomfortable. I'm like, I don't feel good. Uh, I kind of missed eating healthy and I missed being on track. Well, for me, especially after a few days in, I get back to, but I think it was always like this where it's like you're just munching down double stuff Oreos but you're not really like, this is so delicious. You're not really enjoying yeah, it, right? Like it's yeah. almost worth just being healthy five days a week mm. just because you'll enjoy those two days. Right. The pizza at the end of the week is tastes better to you than three pizzas during the week, like if you're doing it all the time. Do you know what I mean? I like totally agree. You enjoy it so much more. Yeah. So I got I I want to get back to eating healthy just to enjoy the food. When yeah. I finally get to eat something. I agree. Eat some crap on the weekend. I'll be like, oh, this is really good. Definitely. Because you stop enjoying it. You're just munching it down. And then when I am eating healthy, my body feels better, and I like that, too. I just yeah, I got to get better. back to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're, we're almost at our t yeah, hour well, here. So how should we summarize this other than dogs are awesome? Yeah, we that's love an easy dogs. summary, yeah. And then um, look back on the year. Pat yourself on the back for all the victories that you had. Yeah. Uh, find some new very long-term or somewhat long-term goal to excite you and then find a process and a system that's going to move you closer to that make up your mind to get it done yeah Convince yeah realize you that you really want it yeah because there's costs involved and and if yeah. you don't want it you're not going to get it done you, you got to get that cost benefit analysis correct uh, in order to to get there and that's it so uh Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And uh, all our, we get some great listeners, and I hope we get more this year. Um, and please rate and review this. Share it on Facebook or social media. Tell people about it. Um, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Dan.